My name is Jeff Crosby. I'm the executive director of the New Link Coalition, and I want to introduce Maria Carrasco. Could you stand up, Maria? She's the president of our coalition. Um, about eight years ago, um, Maria, who was on the school committee at the time, myself, who was the president of the Labor Council, and Pete Capano, who was Ward 6 counselor, and uh, president of Local 201 at General Electric and other places, um, started talking about could we bring together um, a group of activist grassroots organizations that would give Lynn's working class majority a stronger voice in the city. So here we are about eight years later and we are a group of 13 organizations um, including our most recent group uh, which was um, El Centro Maria, I think I said that right, um, and the Juneteenth, North Shore Juneteenth Coalition. And um, we're a group of people that represent working class folks, union and non-union, um, employed or unemployed, you know, high wage or low wage, um, Latino, black, Asian, or white. And um, our goal is to bring all those people together to better the lives of the majority of folks in our community. Because Lynn is a working class town, and, and we understand that, and we want to bring a better voice to that. So um, we've had a number of successes in the last seven or eight years. As you may know, we worked with the Housing Authority and constructed on Washington Street um, what we call Gateway North, with 71 housing units, uh, all the way from Section 8 to market rate and three levels of subsidy in between at a time when there's a desperate need for housing that people can actually, who already live here, can have a chance to stay in, you know, as the rents and housing prices go up. We also worked with the school department and we opened up Lynn Tech at night, which has been a dream for a long time for many of uh, activists in the city. So we now have classes there in three six-week terms. We have about 350 people a year, adults, take classes there. And everything from uh, yoga to welding and a bunch of stuff in between. And that's continuing to grow and to be successful. We've had a cultural night where we invited, actually 300 people came. And they just all talked about why, when my people came to Lynn and why they came. And we explored both all the similar themes, as you would expect, and also the kind of differences you know, that exist in the city of why and when people came. We also support the work of our partners, because each of our organizations has their own activities, their own programs, and we supported Lynn United for Change, for example, when they were able to pass an anti-foreclosure ordinance, making it easier for people to stay in their homes um, when they're under threat of eviction. And we also supported the Lynn Workers Center and the North Shore Labor Council, which passed a wage theft ordinance to try to, act, try to quit um, funding and hiring companies in this town and uh, penalize people who don't, I don't mean who don't pay their workers well, but don't even pay their workers the fair according to the law, minimum wage, overtime, that kind of thing, because that's an epidemic. And those groups continue to, to work on that. We have also do educational programs. We did a film showing on the mining industry in Guatemala and the kind of damage that that does to the country there and the impact it has on people who live there. <clears throat> we brought in Juan Gonzalez, who is a columnist, I think, for the Daily News, an author in New York, an author of a book called Harvest of Empire, also talking about the roots of migration to the United States from other countries in Central and South America. And we're going to continue that tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about what is known um, it's the border crisis. You know, we hear stories about invasions of people and criminals. And, and tonight we're going to look at the actual story and the actual facts between what's going on um, with the, at the border and with immigration right now. And hopefully that will help give up all of us the tools to educate others and to organize others and to beat back some, kind of the, um, some of the kind of racist stuff that's going on in the country right now. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to turn it over to Fabiola Alvarez. Fabiola is an um, extraordinary intern for us. She's done a tremendous amount of work along with Michelle Guzman on this event. This is really a product of their work. And she's an intern working for us from the Salem State School of Social Work. So, Fabiola. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We are very happy to have you here. 
and we want to talk about the purpose of this um, forum. We have heard in the bad media outlets about immigrants lately, and mm -hmm. also by our most recent lawmakers, and the ones that will make um, decisions in regards to immigration. So we decided to do something about that, um, demystify the anti-immigrant hysteria. And tonight, not from us, but from the speaker's experience, you're going to hear about why immigrants come here. What are the different perspectives? Um, what are um, the real uh, facts about um, the reason why immigrants come? So we want you to make your own conclusion. Um, my, in, in my conclusion, in my studies, immigrants are not different from the first immigrants when they came here from other countries, from Europe. Um, they came from different reasons. They were experiencing famine. They were experiencing um, government issues. They had to flee their countries. And they came, they came here and they um, established themselves. They became um, citizens at that time. I don't think there were a lot of issues, less restrain, restrictions than now. But we just want to demystify what we hear um, in stereotypes about immigrants. And based on the speakers, they're going to inform us. They inform us. They're going to educate us about um, We Are there any further? The ground rules. Um, the ground rules. Uh, I think everyone knows this building. <laughs> <laughs> everyone will know where the bathroom is. But one in a specific, please silence your cell phones. We don't want to get interruptions. Such a wonderful, wonderful um, information that we, we are here tonight. And let me tell you, I had taken anthropological um, classes <coughs> and history classes. This is one class. Tonight, you're going to experience what is being taught in some of the um, universities. So welcome um, the speakers. And we are going to, I'm going to introduce Yonerki. She's one of the board members. And I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot something. You might see the uh, index card in, in your seat. That's um, going to be selected for questions. If you have any questions for the speakers, just write it down. We will um, go around, and you, it has to be anonymous. If you don't have to um, say your name, we will read it aloud, and we will answer. The respective speaker will um, answer the question. That's it. You next. Um, welcome, everyone. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Jonerki, and I'm a member of the Highlands Coalition. Um, our first speaker is going to speak to us about the myth of immigration criminology, um, and it will be Tim Sieber who's going to speak to us about that. Tim is a professor of anthropology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, he received his PhD in social anthropology from, the, from New York University with spe specialization in urban anthropology and the Anthropology of Education. He has been at UMass Boston since 1974 and teaches courses on childhood, urban anthropology, applied anthropology, the culture history of Amazonia, and immigration and minority education. Tim has done field research in Boston and New York City, as well as in Caracas, Venezuela, and Lisbon, Portugal. Tim has been a board member of the Brazilian Worker Center since 2009 and has worked on many campaigns, including the tuition equality bill for immigrant students, the Domestic Workers um, Bill of Rights, and anti-wage theft, and the Secure Community Bills. Tim also writes increasingly on the promise and challenges presented by growing students in diversity, higher education. He is co-editor with Ether Kingston Men of recent anthropology, Achieving Against the Odds, How Academics Become Teachers of Diverse Students. So now I present to you Tim um, Sieber. Thank you, Georgina. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here to talk with you tonight, and um, I'm sure the things I'll be talking about, um, you, you already know, more or less. Um, speak up. I'll hold this a little closer, I see. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about tonight about the very strong stereotype that uh, we hear a lot uh, in our society about immigrants being, um, being criminals and being more 
prone to criminal behavior and um, here to hurt and take from American people in, in, through criminal acts. Um, and um, I, you know, I want to call this into question and try to maybe suggest an idea about why this, uh, I, this perception exists among some people or why people advance this when it's so completely untrue. The, the, the opposite is really true. And I'll talk about uh, some of the truth of, of uh, uh, criminality among immigrants and using a lot of statistics from the national government, from the Department of Justice and the FBI, who, who track uh, crime pretty carefully. Um, so, um, should I, you know, how should I do I'll be here. Oh, you, oh, you're, okay, I yep. wasn't sure. So maybe we'll move ahead then. Um, so, you know, we hear a whole lot of things being said today, and it's confusing to a lot of people when somebody as important as the President of the United States says these uh, very dramatic things about um, uh, many migrants to the United States that they are really here for criminal purposes and that they're very bad people uh, who habitually engage in crime. Um, these are some of the, um, the quotes that we've heard recently. The first one everyone knows about, this is uh, the one he made about Mexicans um, in 2016. Um, and, um, and especially uh, undocumented immigration or unauthorized immigration, he, he portrays it very often as a physical threat to, to Americans, that these are, these are dangerous uh, uh, people. And this is the speech that, uh, from the speech he gave last month, trying to justify the wall and why it was important for uh, him to get the money to build uh, the so-called uh, wall down on the border. And, um, and he's also championed the cause of angel moms, uh, and, which is a very tragic thing. There's no question about it. But he, he, uh, he, he's used uh, some people who have been hurt by uh, especially undocumented immigrants to, to tar all immigrants and all undocumented people and even immigrants more widely as, uh, as murderers. Um, so, you know, the reality of the situation is really very different. And we do live in an era in the United States when the foreign-born population, the number of immigrants who live here, has grown enormously. So between 1990 and 2013, um, the foreign-born share of the population grew to 13%. 0.1 percent. It's uh, it went up quite a lot during this time, um, and uh, also the number of unauthorized or undocumented immigrants uh, more than tripled, and it's somewhere around 11 million right now. But it went up uh, in these 25 or so years um, um, from 3.5. Um, but a curious thing uh, during this period when this country is receive so many immigrants. Uh, this is a period of our history when the crime rate has gone down dramatically. Um, so during this time, the rates of violent crime, which include these kinds of um, crimes, it went down by almost half. And um, go ahead. And the rate of uh, property crime, where people steal things or you know, cars or burglarize houses and so on, it went down 41 percent. Um, these statistics are from the FBI. Um, so in the Washington Post uh, recently published uh, uh, an interesting chart that um, when mo the more immigrants come and the more prominent they are in the population, the more the crime rate actually goes down. So the effect of immigrants on the crime rate is a, is a very positive one. Um, and this, de this doesn't only apply to national level crime statistics, but it applies to state statistics, state level, and also local statistics. And in California, um, it was the first state in the country that became a um, majority, well, how do you say it, a majority minority state where white people were the minority of the population. Um, and it's been that way for a long time, I'm guessing 15 or 20 years. Um, Go ahead. Um, so um, crime and violence um, among young people, who especially are tarred with these kinds of stereotypes of being violent and being irresponsible, um, went down 72% during a time when the growth of immigrant youth was uh, absolutely so strong. And 
Um, in California, also, uh, killings among youths, uh, gun violence, uh, went way down. Um, they've been very successful at uh, doing that, even at a time when immigrant youth uh, were growing in huge numbers. Um, so, um, and I think we all know that young men in particular, teenage boys and younger men, um, are especially looked at as kind of having violent tendencies and being dangerous um, if, they're, if they're immigrants, and particularly perhaps if they're from Latin America. Um, so it's interesting to look at the statistics, actually, that, um, um, and these are from 2010, and they're not much different today. Um, and what you can see is that uh, native-born uh, Americans, people who are not immigrants, um, actually go to jail twice as much. The, the rate of incarceration is twice as high as for, for immigrant young men. Um, and overall, um, all the studies, whatever you look at, shows that immigrants are, are less prone to violent behavior and to criminal acts than, um, than native-born um, American people. Um, so this chart, which was also published by the Washington Post, allows you to see that the red column is um, the, um, the percentage of crimes uh, that are actually, or what was that? What does it say? Native Crime Native. rates per 1,000 um, criminal convictions. Conviction rates, and this is Texas, but it's a similar picture everywhere. You can see that the native-born um, offenders are much more prominent and um, contribute a lot more to crime than immigrant people do. The uh, undocumented immigrants are the, is the yellow column, and the uh, blue column is, is legal immigrants. Um, so, uh, yes, please. Um, and they've also looked a lot at younger, less educated men um, without a high school diploma because they're often thought to be especially vulnerable to being drawn into crime since they, um, four, four minutes, okay, because they, um, they have such a hard time finding um, gainful employment with uh, a lack of education. And um, what they found in, uh, uh, is that uh, Americans had an incarceration rate from among this group of young men of 10%. So one out of 10 actually end up in jail. Uh, but it was, in th I think these figures are from California, if I remember right. But the, um, among Mexican men, it's only a third as much. And uh, among Salvadoran and Guatemalan men, who've been very tarred, uh, especially Salvadoran men, with, this, um, with the MS-13 um, kind of scare that's going on, um, they actually have a, um, uh, a rate of incarceration that's only one-fifth of the rate of American men who are in the same social conditions. Um, so um, we have to ask ourselves, why do immigrant youth, in fact, have lower crime rates? The, the, the facts prove that. They have lower crime rates. And I think these are some of the things that people have tended to point to. They have stronger family controls and supervision. Uh, they're more likely to be well integrated into faith communities that also exercise some control over their conduct. And, um, and they have a strong tradition of youth taking responsibility for family and community welfare, playing responsible roles um, in the community and helping their families, especially uh, with the cost of living. And they also see themselves most often as having new opportunities here in the United States as young immigrants, and they work hard to make the best of them um, in order to help themselves and their families. So there's so many things, and I, I know everybody in this room already knows this, and you've seen it in your community and in your families, and you know how unfair it is to um, tar such uh, hardworking, responsible, um, amazing young people that we have in the community today, um, and they're, they're to be admired. Um, so, and actually more widely, uh, youth crime is down in the United States. Um, and of course this encompasses crimes by immigrant youth. Yes. Um, so the Department of Justice has an Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And they say that uh, youth arrests for crime have been going down steadily for the last 20 years. So there's no crisis in youth crime. There really isn't. I mean, youth we shouldn't have any. It's a shame. And 
we have to have a lot of compassion for the victims, of course. But to, to say somehow that this is a uh, crisis that's become magnified is, is simply not true. And this is a chart that um, the peak there is around 1995 or 96. And this goes until 2017. So you can see that for almost 20 years, the trend for youth crime, um, and this is from uh, the Justice Department, um, it has been going down considerably. Um, so, you know, why blame immigrants, and especially immigrant youth, for being criminals, especially when overall crime rates are now historically low? Uh, we don't really have a crime crisis. And when immigrants actually make our communities much safer by lowering the crime rate, uh, committing less crime, and getting imprisoned less, I mean, why? Um, and I, I suggest that it has a lot to do with scapegoating. Um, scapegoating creates a false artificial crisis that does not really exist to divert anger and blame about some real crisis against vulnerable groups. Um, who are not responsible for causing the so-called crisis that they're blamed for, but have fewer resources to defend themselves. Um, and people who scapegoat them know that they are vulnerable and weak in, in, in terms of their power. So, um, and, um, so who are the vulnerable? Uh, they're lower-income people, foreign-born, non-citizens, limited English-speaking people, youth, uh, people of color, and those with insecure immigration status. I mean, they make very convenient targets. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're vulnerable, and you can stir up uh, resentment against them. Um, yes. Um, but wait a second. You know, I, why, why, did, why does somebody need to be blamed at all, especially for a crisis that doesn't really exist? It's a phony issue. Um, and I think there are a lot of things. And I, I know that it sounds like uh, the New Lynn Coalition actually is working to combat a lot of some of the more important and genuine um, problems that we have in our society today. It includes things like uh, dramatically growing social and economic inequality, uh, stagnant or declining real wages, um, including a, 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 an epidemic of wage theft in, in our state. Um, and uh, increasing unaffordability of housing, uh, the decline of our schools and public services uh, because of lack of government funding that is adequate, uh, the shifting of the tax burden away from wealthy people who can afford to pay taxes toward more middle class um, families and who actually are struggling, and uh, the high cost of raising kids uh, and having children paying for childcare and suffocating credit uh, load that people have in terms of credit card and uh, student loans, just to name a few. Um, and then there's racial anxiety. Okay, I'm, I'm done, right? I'm out of time? Okay, <laughs> let me just, this is my last slide, actually. Um, and, you know, obviously, I think um, it, was, um, it was mentioned earlier how much racism there seems to be in a lot of these accusations against immigrants, and it seems to be actually true, and it, it speaks to a kind of uh, racial anxiety that a lot of, uh, especially older white people have in our society, that they are being displaced, and they're going to become a minority very soon. Um, and, you know, young people today, the majority of young people in our society are, in fact, uh, young people of color. And you can see this, this happening, the, the demographic transition. So, um, so I, I would just leave you with uh, these questions, you know, what can we do about all of this and how can we change the narrative? What can we do to change the narrative about immigrants and, and also about crime and, um, and about our societies and uh, this city's real problems? Thank you. So my name is Susan Winning. I am a member of SEIU Local 888 and a delegate to the Labor Council. And it's my honor to introduce the second speaker. Um, so the topic that he's going to be speaking about, um, this is um, Angel Tito Meza. And he's going to be speaking about U.S. and corruption in Latin American government. 
So Angel Tito Mesa began his life as an activist when he was 17 years old in his homeland of Honduras. Tito emigrated from Honduras to the United States in 1972. In 1973, he became involved as an activist in Massachusetts by leading his first union organizing drive to better the conditions of his workplace. Since then, he has dedicated his life to social justice. Among some of the issues that he's worked on are bilingual education in the late 1970s, political advancements in the city of Chelsea, Massachusetts in the 80s, continuous solidarity work with Central American people, and the ongoing struggle for immigrant rights for over 20 years, and needless to say, continuing to, into today. Tito has worked as a community organizer for the Somerville Community Corporation from the years 2003 to 2012. He was also elected to the Chelsea School Committee in 2011. In 1994, Tito earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts. He is a longtime resident of Chelsea, and he volunteers currently as coordinator for Proyecto Andoreño, a grassroots organization serving Hondurans and Latinos in the Boston area. I'd like to welcome uh, Tito up to the... Oh, really, um, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to come and uh, have this uh, conversation with you. Um, I have, a, I guess, I'm lucky to see around this, all these good people here. And they are, <laughs> I recognize some of the ex IUE, I was a member also of the union, the IUE. There was a mention, um, and always Jeff Crosby. <laughs> Jeff was, a, was the president of the union, so I was part of that union. Uh, but uh, I'm very uh, pleased to have uh, this opportunity to talk about Honduras and Latin America. Most of my focus will be Honduras, I, I am from Honduras. And these days, uh, I guess we are uh, the headache of uh, Donald Trump, uh, with all these people coming to the border, and you know, he said, "You don't know what to do. This is a crisis. We need to mobilize the troops." And so I said, "Damn, what are you going to do?" And so I said, "Suyapa, uh, Suyapa sitting up front." I said, "Suyapa, we have to move our troops. So where are those troops that we have? <laughs> we have to defend." So I say, "Well, Suyapa, we." Everyone, when you go out, if you really feel the pain of people who come in the caravan, you have to say, I'm one of the people from the caravan. What's wrong with that? Every, everybody trying to save their own life. So what's going on with Honduras? Why people live in Honduras? Well, it is a history. Um, back in the 1800s, uh, there was a a saying in the beginning of 1900s, uh, I was uh, uh, one of the big bosses of the uh, banana plantation. Uh, uh, he was saying one time, uh, in Honduras, it's, it's more expensive to buy a mule than, uh, than a congressperson. Mm -hmm. So that would tell you the corruption didn't start recently. So we are part, we have that problem, and, and that's what that, that's what create the, the, the natural uh, resources of Honduras go to some few people. And they become rich. And the majority is still poor. Uh, we did have tried to change. The people from Honduras trying to change. Uh, 2009 uh, was a, a progressive government there. Uh, uh, Manuel Zelaya Rosales. She was our truck. Uh, with the uh, direction of the embassy, uh, with the U.S. Embassy, was involved. Uh, one of the crimes that he committed was to raise the minimum salary. Well, he, wanna, he, he realized that the, raising the minimum salary would really cut the uh, poverty level. So uh, they overthrew Celaya, uh, and uh, uh, minimum salary the, he increased a little bit for a little while, but then we discover because the few people who control the economy of Honduras, corporation and also the U.S. government, has been involved. 
So the day when uh, Manuel Zelaya was uh, overthrown, that day uh, he flew, they flew him to, from a, a military base called Palmerola. That military base is owned by, by the United States, and they have, uh, they have been 500, 600 troops there regularly since the 80s. We uh, used that military base to destabilize the government of uh, Nicaragua and uh, the struggle in the South of Guatemala. They, uh, from there, they, they uh, helped to organize the contrast in Honduras that we, we have in, in the 80s. Uh, so, uh, in reality, as the people have been um, taken off from Honduras uh, by uh, hundreds, uh, it's like a 20 a day. Like uh, last year, it was 100,000 people uh, take off from Honduras. And uh, some of them are in uh, Mexico. Uh, the National Registry of Health and the Refugees in Mexico have a number, say they have a, uh, 28,000 uh, from last year that apply for a stay in Mexico. We don't know, we don't have a really formal statistic of how many. For majority of those 28,000, 80% were from Honduras. So we have living, and we uh, have a high crime in Honduras, not just the poverty level, but with the corruption is, is it greater. Uh, in 2013, uh, there was a, a basically uh, they uh, still uh, 350,000 uh, uh, million dollars from the Social Security. That was to pay the uh, campaign of the uh, Orlando Hernandez, who is the actual president of Honduras, and with the knowledge of the U.S. Embassy. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, he in, in 2013 he. He becomes somehow a, a president, uh, still in the election for Xiomara Castro, or Xiomara Celaya. And, and then in 2017 was an election that was a, a take 20 days to give the results. Okay, that's a change for a country that take 20 days to say um, that, um, you know, you elected a president. So it's obviously it's illegal. His brother become uh, an, an assembly, uh, also one of the Congress people in 2013. So in, uh, last year, uh, he was uh, extradited to the United States because he was uh, a, a great boss on, the, on, a, on a drug traffic. And is the brother of Juan Orlando Hernandez. Uh, so we have uh, those serious uh, problems and, and I, which I have more time to explain the reality of Honduras. What I know about Honduras, what I know about El Salvador, what I know about Venezuela, we're talking about Latin America, is the people really want to uh, change things for the better. But I think it's somebody there, and, I, and it's not somebody. I think the government of the United States and multinational corporations are there that they don't want to allow those countries to develop in their own economy, and therefore, that money that is still from those countries become to become uh, to make uh, rich that one percent who control the United States. So I leave it right there. And if you have somebody have a question later on, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Angelica. I am with Neighbor to Neighbor. I'm the Lynn Chapter organizer. Um, and I'm here to present Aviva Chop Chopsky. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so, a little history of her. Um, she's a professor of history and coordinator of Latin American, Latin and Caribbean studies at Salem State University. Author of several books, including her two most recent, they take our jobs and 20 other myths about immigration and undocumented, how immigration became illegal. Aviva's most recent areas of interest are the Cuban Revolution, Northern Colombia's coal industry, and immigration and undocumented in the United States. In Eva's own words, I incorporate the issues of colonialism, colonialism, colonialism. <laughs> economic development, 
migration, race, labor, environment, and global inequality. Much of the scholar, scholarly work can be traced back to the year I spent working for the United Farm Workers Union back in 1976 to 1977. I credited this experience with sparkling, with sparking my interest in the Spanish language and migrate workers and immigration, in labor history, in social movements and labor organizing, in multi, multinationals and their workers, and how global economic forces affect individuals and how people collectively organize for social change. That was a mouthful. Just saying. <laughs> All right. So I'm actually going to talk about all of those things in my 10 minutes here tonight. So hang on. <laughs> I'm going to try to talk really fast. Um, because I was given a big task um, to talk about the issue of jobs and the myth of do immigrants take American jobs? And that's actually the title of one of my books. They take our jobs and 20 other myths about immigration. So you know I think that's a myth. Um, but I think in order to answer that question, do immigrants take our jobs, we need to, well, I'm a historian, so we have to go back into history a little bit. Um, but I think in order to talk about immigrants and jobs, we also have to talk about race. Uh, we also have to talk about colonialism. So I am going to talk about race and colonialism in trying to answer the question, historically, do immigrants take American jobs, or what does that question even mean? That is, in, for, in one respect, I feel like we can't even answer the question because the question is based on false premises. It doesn't mean anything. So I hope I can bring you along with me to, to understand that. Um, so to begin with, in terms of the history of jobs in the United States, I would say that we need to begin with the concept that the United States is a country built on settler colonialism. Settler colonialism describes a particular kind of colonialism where the colonizers, instead of going to rule over and extract labor and resources from a native population, which describes Spanish colonialism in the Americas, it describes British colonialism in Africa, in India. Um, in settler colonialism, the colonizers uh, have the goal of eliminating the native population and replacing it with a white settler population. That's what happened in the United States with the British colonizers. Their goal was to eliminate the native population and replace it with a white settler colonial population. Now, this means a couple of things with respect to immigration. It means that immigrants are actually the privileged class. Right? Immigrants are at the top because immigrant means white European. And in the very beginning of this, uh, this session, Fabiola said something that I'm going to challenge because it's something that we hear a lot and I think we need to challenge it. She said, well, the immigrants who are coming today are very similar to the immigrants who came, the European immigrants who came in the 1900s. And I would say, in some ways they're similar, but in some ways they're different. That is, European immigration in the 19th century was a government-sponsored project of bringing white Europeans in order to create a white population on native lands. Think what's happening in the history of the United States in the 19th century. It's like westward expansion, manifest destiny. That is settler colonialism. That's why you need white European immigrants to replace the native population which you are in the process of exterminating, driving off its land. So white European immigrants were explicitly brought to the United States for that purpose. Now, in this same time period, people from Africa were also being brought to the United States. They were being brought to the United States to labor in the lowest sectors of, of the US economy, the lowest but very, very necessary sectors of the economy, in particular in agriculture and in domestic work. 
people of color were needed in the settler colonial society in order to free up white people to enjoy the privileges of citizenship. Black people who were forcibly brought to the United States were not immigrants. They could never become citizens of the United States. They were brought to be an exploited labor force on a permanent basis. So if we look at the, the 19, 19th century, there's really three main categories of people in the United States. They're immigrants who are by definition white because citizenship is restricted by race. Only white people can be citizens of the United States. There are black people who are not immigrants who are enslaved until after the 1860s and who are still forced into the lowest sectors of the economy, especially agriculture and domestic service. And there are native people who are being forcibly eliminated from the society. So this is where the European immigrants are coming in. And that's why I say that the European immigrants of the 1800s and early 1900s were very different in some ways from the immigrants who are coming in today. Um, the United States still has a very divided labor market today. That is, it has lower sectors of the economy, particularly in agriculture and in the services, which have been excluded deliberately, legally and socially, from all of the uh, reforms that happened in the 20th century that helped primarily white urban workers gain the rights of full citizenship. And those rights include right to housing, right to health care, right to decent wages, right to higher education. Um, white people gained those rights, while people of color continued to be, and, and they gained many of those rights through the workplace, through union organizing, while people of color continued overwhelmingly to be excluded from those rights. In the meantime, we start in, after the United States takes 50% of Mexico's territory in the 1850s, um, we start to have the development of agriculture, mining, railroads in the western portion of the new, newly taken lands. Um, and the labor force there is also an exploited labor force made up of people of color, primarily Mexicans, who are also denied citizenship. So this idea of bringing workers from Latin America to do the dirtiest and the worst work, to be excluded from legal rights, and to be deportable, that's one way that Mexicans have always been marginalized and excluded from citizenship through changing legal regimes from the 1850s until the 20, 2018, legal regimes that construct Mexican workers as deportable in order to continue exploiting them. So do immigrant workers take American jobs? Let me just say one more thing, and I know I'm running out of time here too. Um, I think we need to question the very concept of American jobs, because especially as the 20th century progressed, many jobs the United States is part of a global economy. Part of that global economy is based on extracting resources from Central America, right? And Mexico and other parts of Latin America and other parts of the world. Increasingly towards the end of the 20th century, this meant using labor in Latin America not just to extract resources for the benefit of the United States, and I say of the United States, meaning of US corporations, who are the ones that are profiting, but also for the US population, because we all consume those resources. As the 20th century drew to a close, factory labor was also exported to take advantage of cheap, exploitable Mexican, Central American workers in their own country. So I would say we have an economy that's based on exploiting Latin American workers in their own countries and in the United States. And what we need if we want to talk about social justice is a major economic 
restructuring that grants rights to all workers. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tish Mukala. I'm a, a resident of Lynn. I'm a member of uh, Highland Coalition. I'm a co-chair of the Highland Coalition. I'm also a new vice president of the New Lynn Coalition. So I have the honor to present Reverend Eduardo Casares. So the subject that he's going to talk about today is the length, the length depth, drugs, and youth dis displacement. So Reverend Casares is a resident of Lynn since 2009. He's a minister at, a good, at the Good Prophecy Church in Lynn. He graduated from the Leadership Institute, Institute and Biblical Center, and he's an activist who has been involved in initiatives that protect the dignity of immigrant family. In 2016, he traveled to San Marcos, Guatemala twice that year to demystify the rumor of San Marcos' humble habitant. He returned to Esquintla, Guatemala to bring donation to survival of um, the victim of volcano eruption in June of 2018. He ran a support group for young immigrants, giving them temporary, giving them the opportunity to express their narrative, their narrative of what it is, to, it means to be an immigrant in America. Pastor Casares has been a part of Lean Rapid Response network and most recently has been actively engaged in the, you know, in this forum planning. So without further delay, let me introduce to you Reverend Caceres. Buenas noches a todos. Um, good evening everybody. Es una gran oportunidad de estar aquí compartiendo con ustedes y les agradecemos mucho que nos acompañen en esta noche. It's, um, it's a great opportunity to be uh, talking with you tonight. And, um, and it's, uh, I'm very glad to be with you. Eh, quiero hablar en esta noche uh, por qué vienen los inmigrantes. I would like to talk tonight about why the immigrants be, uh, come into this country. En especial un grupo, eh, un grupo de guatemaltecos que llegan desde el norte de Guatemala para con México. A group who's coming from the north of Guatemala. Uno, uno, si pudiéramos decir algo, ¿por qué llegan los inmigrantes? Porque necesitamos hablar inglés también. If, um, if we can say something about immigrants, why the immigrants come into this country is because we uh, like to learn English too. Y en eso estamos, estamos trabajando. And then we're working on it. <laughs> Quería decirle que I'd like to say, en nuestra ciudad de Lynn tenemos un grupo bien grande de guatemaltecos que en los últimos años han llegado en este proceso de inmigración grande que se ha desarrollado en los últimos años. Um, we like, I'd like to say that um, in Lynn, in the ciudad of City of Lynn, we have a whole, a whole bunch, um, a group of Guatemala uh, citizens. Uh, ellos provienen de un departamento. And they come in for a, for a department. Uh, llamado San Marcos. Uh, the department they call San Marcos. Es frontera con México al noroeste. No, no, uh, no east of Mexico. Y la gran mayoría de ellos llegan aquí de esa área llegan aquí al área de North Shore en especial. And, and the majority of those um, uh, those persons coming um, over here and they they live um, around. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, San Marcos. Okay, okay. 
this group of person coming for a for a son from uh, a very high son. Ellos viven a 2500 de 2500 a 3300 metros de altura. They live between 225 or 3300. Unos 10000 pies de altura. Uh, this is like saying 10000 feet high. Um, ellos son gente muy trabajadora. They are people very uh, hard worker. <coughs> Um, en su gran mayoría son agricultores. Uh, the majority they are they coming for um, for the for the farm. Yeah. Uh, se dedican a plantar papa, maíz y diversos granos. They plant potatoes, corn and different grain. Querías eh, hacía una mención de de la altura en donde ellos viven. I like to uh, talk about a little bit on the mountain where they live. Por la condición climática. Uh, because the, um, um, the weather. Y también por lo ondulado del terreno and, donde ellos trabajan y plantan. And then uh, because, uh, and, and the way they plant. Um, el, el terreno. El, el, the ground. Yeah, the ground. Yeah. Uh, esto hace, eh, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it, the, 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 the ground is very, very high. Tuve la oportunidad de, de estar por allí. I had the opportunity to be uh, down there. Y me recordé a mis inicios en las escuelas primarias de mi país cuando nos enseñaban uh, sobre cultivar en las alturas. I remember when I used to live there, down there, when I was a little, when I was in an element school, and I used to go um, to the to 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 the farm. Yeah. Y descubrí que es un arte muy grande lo que ellos desarrollan. I uh, discovered that was a, like an art, en, like the development an art. En su trabajo de agricultura. And um, and in the way that they they work on the farm. Grandes montañas eh, plantadas eh, a trabajo con tra con herramientas de mano. Big mountain when the um, which is tool they use is their own hands. Ellos no usan maquinaria ni animales para plantar. They don't, they don't use um, um, uh, animales, animales, animales ni, like, ni máquinas. Like, like, máquinas. Okay. They don't, they don't use machine. Machine. Oh, yeah, machines or, or, or animals. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, pero, eh, una de las cosas muy importantes que nosotros hemos aprendido es ver que esa fuerza que ellos tienen es la que está llegando aquí. But um, what we I like to say is that the, that that I what I see in, in those people is is um, the effort they do to to do the same thing they do in the country to do it in here. Um, ver esas montañas es como ver a alguien que ha pintado la montaña con sus propias manos. And see those mountains, it's like they paint those mountains with their own hands. Y esa gente que pinta esa montaña con sus propias manos, trabajando y sembrando, es la que nosotros estamos recibiendo aquí. And those people who paint those mountains with their own hands are the people that we see in here. Ellos tienen que enfrentar no solamente las montañas y el clima, sino también deben de plantar, cosechar y también comercializar lo que ellos hacen. So, um, they also, uh, they bring over the mountain to this country, they, uh, they, the way they paint those mountain to this country, but also in the way they plant those... Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Here. Yeah, the tools that they use to yeah. plant those. Okay. Okay. Quería decirles que era importante ver que el comercio que debían desarrollar. I like to 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 see uh, and then the the um, wherever they want to develop in here. Tienen que transportarlo por rutas eh, con un gran desafío por medio de las montañas. They had to, uh, the, the, the transportation they use is, is very difficult on the mountains. Es muy, comer, es muy común ver uh, grandes accidentes. It's very common to see a lot of accidents. Eh, no todos tienen transporte para transportar su, mm, su, pla, sus cosechas. No all of them they have transport, uh, transportation. 
Ellos deben de pagarle a alguien que transporte sus cosechas. They have to pay somebody else y, ese, y, y ese esfuerzo que ellos hacen se les suma. And that effort that they do se le suma también eh, el costo de otros escalones en el proceso de, de su plantación. Un viaje de, siete, de dos horas en ruta normal, ellos lo tienen que hacer de cinco a siete horas. Uh, the route uh, usually takes uh, two hours to, to, uh, to transport those products. And they, they spend like a six hours. Uh, ellos también deben de enfrentar y a ellos les afecta a las políticas globales de comercio que son parte de, de sus desgracias también. No pueden competir eh, con el resto de, de, de la sociedad en, con sus productos ni con calidad ni con cantidad que es uno de los requerimientos de, del sistema global que hoy vivimos además de esta región tiene conflicto por más de 80 años entre aldeas por las tierras en, que han, eh, en las que ha llegado a desarrollar lucha armada han habido secuestro, intervención del gobierno, the kidnapping, the go the government had to, um, eh, en donde han tenido que llegar el el los militares a gobernar. To, yeah, to a esto se le suma la lucha del narcotráfico por this plantar amapola para la producción de opio y heroína. Also, um, la plantación de opio y heroína. La pl plantación de... La, el trabajo del narcotráfico para la plantación de opio narcotráfico for the, pla for, for the plantation of the heroin ocupar precisamente eh, la, la, la tierra con la plantación de, de amapola hace que aumenten las presiones y muchas veces el gobierno llega y, a, y eh, las amapolas están plantadas juntas con las demás plantas. Okay, when we plant the amapola uh, with another plant, is um, that 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 area is in a, they work uh, under a lot of pressure because the consumer of yeah. that area. Yeah. Y, y, y de, luego eso hace que muchas veces el gobierno llegue y arranque las plantas de amapola y con eso también arranque las plantas, los cultivos normales. So the government had to come and, and um, uh, take those plants, the amapola plants, and then the, the good ones also, they take care of. Además de esto, se enfrentan otras luchas como la buena, como una precaria atención médica pública. Also, um, uh, the health is uh, the, the health public is very. Is, they have to pay the price for that. Un bajo nivel de educación. And this education is very low. Para poder a, la mayoría de los muchachos de los de los niños no terminan la primaria. So the most of the the kids they don't finish the elementary school. Y quienes terminan la primaria deben uh, deben pagar en la secundaria. And the, whoever finish the uh, elementary school they have to pay for the. Aproximadamente high 60 dólares por mes. Aproximadamente 60 dólares por mes. Eh, eso hace que muchos eh, eh, no puedan terminar los estudios. Por eso también la consecuencia de violencia en el resto del país. Por las pandillas, los robos, Again, el narcotráfico. Robbery. Narco, son, par perfect. son parte de la lucha de esta gente que it's, enfrenta it's a diario of, para poder sobrevivir. Los desastres naturales como terremotos, volcanes y huracanes. Han sido parte de estas desgracias también. 
yeah, it's, it's, that, that is very, um, it's, a, it's like a program emergency that we... El gobierno tiene un sistema de emergencia, pero muchas veces no alcanza para poder they ayudar. They have a program emergency, uh, but it, sometimes it's, it's not enough. Recientemente, en junio del pasado año, ocurrió una poderosa erupción de volcán de fuego en Ecuincla, en Guatemala. Más de 500 personas desaparecieron. More than 500 people disappeared. Más de 500 casas fueron, más de 500 casas, familias fueron desa, eh, desarmadas. More than 500, uh, family. Y eso hace que mucha gente no tenga un horizonte mejor is, uh, that's, uh, that's para, poder, para poder superar la emergencia. To, to, to with, uh, para, ir con, para concluir en esta hora, like eh, es muy importante que nosotros veamos todas estas cosas It's para saber que que esta gente que ha llegado a estar junto con nosotros en nuestra ciudad encuentra en este país un escape para refrescar sus vidas porque este país les proyecta esperanza. Corren el riesgo para llegar y ese riesgo es hasta su propia vida no vienen aquí por un capricho personal no son delincuentes son seres, no son seres inhumanos son un potencial de jóvenes y niños que huyen por un lugar mejor más que delincuentes eh, o personas que se han sido vistas muchas veces por nuestra sociedad por, solamente porque aparentan ser de otra cultura por ello necesitan ser orientados, so educados y afirmado para un potencial mejor. Concluyo con un pensamiento personal. Llegan aquí a, a estas tierras porque estas tierras pueden recibirlos y pueden ser parte de su bienestar y el de sus familias y ellos pueden ser muy productivos también para nosotros muchas gracias Uh, my, uh, my name is David Gass. I'm director of the Highlands Coalition. You talk about immigrants in the Highlands, probably 70 to 80 percent of the people who live in that neighborhood who were born outside the United States from all over the world. And just to show you, we have a garden, for example, that is twice as big as this building. We have people from 10 countries growing food. It's amazing. We share meals together. It's a wonderful experience. They talk about their, their, what the, the food meant to their country because they miss their country. They miss touching the soil. So I'd, um, I invite you, to, all of you, to come up and join us. We'll give you the plants, we'll give you the seeds, we'll teach you how to grow food, okay? That's the guarantee. All right, I want to introduce a woman who, Virginia Lee. Woo! All right, Virginia Lee. Um, and uh, she has firsthand experience on, on the uh, border. And here's her a little bio. She earned her BA in American Studies with a focus on race and ethnicity in North American society. In 2007, Virginia spent the majority of her senior year studying both the bo along the border in Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, and in central Mexico in the state of Morelos. Her time uh, was spent at a detention center for unaccompanied minors in Mexico who were being repatriated and detained on the Mexican side of the border. She became fluent in Spanish, learned about border history, and the relationship between the United States and Mexico. In 2016, Virginia was awarded the Excellence in Human Services Award bestowed by the Social Services Community of Brockton, Mass., for her work 
uh, and mental health and legal services to the indigenous Ecuadorian community there. She currently lives and works in Massachusetts with her husband and two daughters and continues to champion uh, immigrant rights as a social worker at the Lynn Community Health Center. And um, I just want to say that um, she, uh, she has to give us firsthand experience uh, testimony from a family whose child was detained at the border. And I want to welcome Virginia Lee. Hi, everybody. I feel like a young sapling here next to such tall trees of uh, powerhouses for social change. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to call up um, a dear friend of mine um, who spent some time living at my house after he and his son were separated at the border um, in the wave of the crisis between um, well, that was highlighted between April and uh, July of last year. Um, and he's going to tell a little bit about his story, and then I'm going to talk just a little bit about the role of um, both the Rapid Response Network here in Lynn, um, that is a coalition of uh, about 30 organizations who have come together since um, the 2016 elections to um, quickly respond to urgent crises among immigrant families here in Lynn when a family member is detained or deported um, and the, um, the absence of their presence and their um, productivity and their love and their support of their families leaves um, a um, hollow and unfillable gap that the um, community of Lynn has realized we need to help to fill. So, uh, without further ado, Oliverio, usted puede venir aquí. Uh, I will translate for him, but this is uh, Jose Oliverio Diaz. Um, Oliverio comes from Guatemala. Um, he worked as a nurse um, uh, in Guatemala prior to arriving at the U.S. border with his son, who was 15 at the time. Um, he and his son were separated at the border for a period of approximately 60 days um, before being reunited and um, brought to Massachusetts through a vast network of volunteers and friends and supporters of the folks who were separated at the border. Um, I had the privilege of hosting him for about a month at my house uh, before we found him a place to live here in Lynn and, and begin his life with his son. So. Oliverio, no más este, este que tenemos que hacer, las cosas están, y ahorita le voy a dar el micrófono para que pueda explicar, ¿ok? Si puede pararse de vez en cuando para que yo pueda explicar. Okay. I'll translate for him. Sí, eh, buenas noches a todos. Good evening, everyone. Mi nombre es uh, Oliverio Díaz. My name is Oliverio. Soy Díaz. guatemalteco y de profesión, pues soy enfermero. Trabajé mucho tiempo en mi país, en el Sierra. Uh, my name is Oliverio Díaz. I'm a Guatemalan man and I worked for several years in my profession as a nurse. Bien, eh, yo igual que muchas personas. Y centroamericanas y tal vez de otros países, hemos venido acá a este país por situaciones fuertes ¿verdad? que nos ha correspondido, pero el proceso ha sido duro. Um, I, like many other folks from Central America and other countries, um, have come to the United States for very um, grave and serious reasons. Eh, yo eh, Pues al igual que muchas personas, eh, venimos, conmigo viene un niño, él tiene 15 años. As uh, with many other families, I came with my son of 15 years. El nombre de él es Hugo. His name is Hugo. Bueno, eh, para recordar situaciones, pues a veces uno pues... Le vuelve a la mente situaciones muy desagradables. When, uh, sometimes when people think of things that have happened that are very difficult and painful, um, 
memories come to mind that uh, make it difficult to talk about. Porque eh, yo eh, y muchas personas eh, fuimos um, maltratados y separados de nuestros hijos. I and many other people uh, on the border were mistreated and um, separated from our children. En donde pues eh, sufrimos mucha, mucho maltrato psicológico. We suffered significant um, psychological mistreatment. Y la larga separación de, de nuestros hijos. And a long separation from our children ya que muchas veces el sistema de político de la detención de los indocumentados the, eh, the undocumented the, the system the political system of um, undocumented folks eh, nos estuvieron bueno cuando estuvimos detenidos pues estuvimos nos movían de un centro de detención a otro y así continuamente. Had us being moved from one detention center to another continually throughout the time. Esta situación pues cuando nos separaron eh, fue muy muy duro, muy cruel, muy inhumano. The situation of when they separated us was terrible, difficult, inhumane. Cruel. Estábamos muchas personas ahí y en los momentos pues nos llamaban para documentar. <coughs> there were lots of people there and in the moment when they uh, called us to go and register ourselves. En, en esa, el lugar que le llaman ICE. In the place that they called ICE. Y en ese momento llamaban a los niños también para documentarlo junto con el padre o madre. And o they would call the children to come and document themselves along with their mother or their father. Y entonces era el momento pues a mí me dijeron bueno eh, déle tus bendiciones a tu hijo. Uh, in that moment they said um, give your son your blessings. Y yo no entendí por qué me decía eso y So, lo abracé y, y me preguntó él, ¿esto ya va a terminar? Um, no lo sé. Um, I didn't know why they were asking me to do that. Um, so I just, I hugged him and I said, I, I don't know when this is going to end. Y bueno, era como a las dos de la mañana, yo estaba un poco así somnoliento con sueño. It was about 2 a.m. and I was very um, overcome by exhaustion. Nos documentaron, él se fue, los tenían en una celda aparte a los niños de acuerdo a las edades y a los adultos en otro espacio. Uh, they, they finished the documentation and then there were um, cells for the children depending on their age and then for the adults. Eh, se veía muchas situaciones, muchas madres llevaban niños de meses, año, año, dos años y era cruel verlos cómo les arrebataban los niños de, de los brazos. Tráigalo por acá porque usted se queda para allá y los niños van para aquí. It was unimaginable to watch so many mothers and children, babies of months old, a year, two years, and the way that they were ripped from their mother's arms to separate them as the children were taken one direction and the parents in the other. Hubo un caso entre muchos que yo estuve observando y eh, pues fue muy cruel donde el niño no se desprendía del, del papá y se lo arrebataron y was, lloraron mucho y así todos los problemas. There was one situation that stays in my mind of a young boy who just would not allow himself to be ripped from his parent and um, they, they, they cruelly had to pull him away. Bueno, tengo mucho que contar pero por el tiempo no, no se puede. Bueno, quiero decirles de que yo pues y soy parte de la organización de ECO también. He tratado de, 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 de incluir, de ingresar a las organizaciones para ver que, eh, cómo podemos así producir. Porque estamos formando una cooperativa para, para trabajo de personas que están en mi situación. Hay varias y eh, estamos en el proceso de formación. Vamos a estar recibiendo capacitación. 
Uh, there's so much for me to say, um, but because of time, I, I won't be able to tell you all. But um, I want to let you know that I am here in Lynn, now a member of ECHO, and we are working towards creating a coalition or a, co a, a work cooperative um, so that we can be productive members of this community. Porque nosotros tenemos visión de trabajo, visión de contribuir con la economía. No, no venimos a hacer carga. Tenemos we, we trabajo. Want, we want to be productive. We want to be part of the economy. We did not come to be a burden on this society. We want to be able to work. Bien, entonces, eh, eso es lo que hemos... Eh, lo poco que les he contado va, tenemos eh, un grupo de personas haciendo este tipo de organización tenemos visión, tenemos talento, tenemos energía para sacar adelante eh, nuestros objetivos ya que pretendemos pues que con nuestro talento, nuestro esfuerzo contribuir a ganarnos y a, a ser responsable con nosotros mismos y con los hijos. So we, in this group of people, we have talents and skills and we wish to share them and contribute to the society and also to earn our own living. Um, and we feel that with our skills and our strength and our efforts, we will be able to um, be productive members of this society. Bien, gracias. Buenas noches. Thank you very much. So I have about a minute to ask you one question. Yeah. Who here has a doctor? Nobody has a doctor here? PCP, anybody have a primary care doctor? Oh, I do. Okay. Um, the reason that you have a doctor is so you don't get sick and so sick that you end up in the emergency room costing either your family or your community or the state a ton of money, right? So that's what community health centers do for people. We, we offer alternatives to having to wait until your cancer is at stage four or until um, that gash that you got because you have diabetes is now gangrene, right? Um, but most people don't realize that um, getting to that process, getting enrolled in health insurance, having access to care is actually a, a, a significant privilege if you have never been in this country before and don't know how the systems work. One of the most important ways that the Lynn Rapid Response Network has tried to be supportive to the communities, um, uh, the immigrant communities here in Lynn, is in connecting folks um, to the community health center, which services about 40,000 residents in the Lynn area um, and provides uh, much needed and beneficial services. Um, when you imagine and hear the stories of folks who have arrived here, who have gone through so much in their home countries, who have gone through so much to come here, and then who continue to fight um, and ignore the signs and symptoms of any kind of illness, flu, or whatever, because they don't want to lose their jobs, um, you realize how important it is for community health centers to provide certainly physical, medical care, um, but also access to the insurance so that that care doesn't um, cost the state or the individual so much money that it's cost prohibitive. The other reason that the Lynn Rapid Response Network has worked so diligently to be a huge um, collaborator with the Lynn Community Health Center is because many folks who come having faced so much trauma and continue to face trauma and the stressors of adjusting to life in an entirely new country, new weathered patterns, new climate, and new language is that the mental stress is in incredibly intense and mental health services, folks like myself as a clinical social worker, um, uh, we, we work very hard to help people to manage that stress, to work through that stress and to process the traumas that brought them here or that continue to keep them in situations that may be unsafe or unhealthy. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you that um, it's, it's, uh, it's such important work, all of the different facets, the adult education, the workers supports, the, um, the empowerment building, the community building, the, the access to community care and health services that um, Lynn has been able to, um, 
to erect in the uh, rapid response network and, and all the work that all of our organizations do. It's a pleasure to be part of that. Um, thank you so much, and we'll take questions. Oh, shoot, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, every month, is this on? Um, every month, um, the Lynn Rapid Response Network hosts a um, community clinic. It's a support clinic. It's a moment for um, ex receiving solidarity and community support. Um, by other members who are also immigrants and also people who are in solidarity with those folks. Um, it's also a time for community members to receive um, social work and case, con case, um, case management consultations, um, as well as legal um, intakes, or well, legal consultations and information. And, um, and also it, we provide dinner, and last week, two weeks ago it was, we had 65 people at our clinic. It's been growing steadily since we started last May, and I have flyers for it. They're only in Spanish, but um, you are welcome to them and to pass them out to the folks that you serve in your communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, we are very close to end of our program. I want to thank you guys for sticking here. Um, if you have a moment to stand up, stretch a little bit, just because we have the last 10 minutes um, to close, but also uh, because we, we're going to collect the questions. Obviously, we're not going to be able to read them all out to our um, panelists, but I will ask you to please write down your email because we are going to, uh, thank you, because we're going to um, send a reply or an answer to you guys if we don't uh, have enough time. We, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to uh, uh, make uh, or ask all these questions, but I definitely will answer a few. Um, but again, thank you so much for all our panelists. If we can give uh, another round of applause for them. Thanks so much for sticking around. And um, I'm just going to ask my friend Fabiola if uh, you can pass in all the answers to her. I mean, all the questions, I'm sorry. All the questions to Fabiola. Don't forget to put your um, email address so we can reply to that. I'm going to start with the first question. Um, there is no specifically, but you guys can decide who is the best person to explain this. It says, please explain School of the Americas and the role played by its graduates in Central America opposition today. I, uh, they said to me that you will be able to understand what that School of the Americas means. Um, anyone in particular, um, Abby or Mr. Sure. Uh, this, uh um, the School of the American uh, is responsible for training uh, people who have participated uh, through the 80s and 90s uh, of torture and assassination of political leaders and uh, religion leaders like Monsignor Romero, some of the uh, David Davison was in the School of the American graduate. Um, Guatemala have other graduates from uh, the School of the America. They have played a role in the uh, extermination of the indigenous communities, and I don't know if Abby have a part of it. Um, oh, so I just want to um, begin by adding, so the School of the Americas is run by the U.S. Army. It's the U.S. Army School of the Americas. It's a school that they created to train Latin American military leaders who are chosen, they're trained, and we have um, overwhelming abundant evidence from the last three decades, four decades, that many of the graduates from the School of the Americas have gone back to join right-wing governments, to form death squads, to be responsible for torture and assassinations in Latin America. So the School of the Americas has a very bad name among people in Latin America. Thank you so much. And I want to also add, this is a very personal issue for me, because when Obama was in the administration, uh, Hillary Clinton was the uh, Secretary of State. And, he and she apologized to the Guatemala government and the Guatemala country because back in the 70s, they used medical um, um, army, I mean, they used um, America, um, Guatemalan soldiers to um, try for medical ex experiment at Sicily. So um, you can see that the United States has a lot of influence in the Central, Central America and other parts of the world. So, uh, might not be necessarily the college or the um, the school of the Americas, but definitely they 
uh, press the power and they also go beyond um, the things that they need to do. And it doesn't don't matter what price, but anyway. So that's a, my addition to that. <laughs> it was personally when I saw her saying, um, apologizing for that. Okay, um, another um, um, question is, um, could each panelist say one thing very briefly that could change the immigration policy uh, to fix it? What would be one thing that you will say, Mr. Sieber, Dr. Professor Sieber? What would be one thing that could uh, change the immigration policy? Most other countries that. No. Most other countries that depend so much on immigrant labor as we do treat uh, their immigrants with somewhat more respect and um, they institute regularization schemes where people who um, have a, a precarious status can be um, given um, regular status and um, feel secure and not have to worry about being deported. And um, we haven't done anything like this for, uh, it, I think it's more than 30 years now since we've ever rethought uh, what to do with so many people here who have insecure status. Um, and to pay them back in any way for everything they've contributed to economic growth and uh, the quality of life of so many American people, families, and communities. So we, we should seriously think about that. Thank you. Mr. Mesa? Yeah, uh, I think the, to solve the problem, uh, immigrant problem here, I think uh, the young people in the uh, United States have a task. And I think that task is to uh, change the direction that is going. Uh, you cannot have a global economy uh, and continue the policies of the past, uh, there are greater other uh, powers that are emerging in the world. And I don't think the way to do it is to uh, 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 stigmatize immigrants. I think that this country is going in a back direction. Racism has increased, uh, even fascists. If nobody knows what fascism means, as the as Look at the statistics of the, of the Germany of the 1940s. So the United States, and I'm not irresponsible to say it, but it's sad to hear from some of the people in the government how they talk about us, mm -hmm. what is getting close to say, let's burn them, let's throw them in the ocean. So I think it's a great challenge, the, the young people here, to uh, get involved, convince, because it's a struggle, and that's when it's a struggle to change, it's, it's a challenge. And I hope that people take that challenge in the United States, otherwise we are in, in, in a big shape. Um, I completely agree with the previous two speakers that um, we need reforms and much better treatment for immigrants in this country, but I want to emphasize another side of it, that is most people who come to the United States today don't want to come. They want to stay home. And the reason that they can't stay home is deeply involved with US policies towards their countries. Exploitative, criminal, uh, military, political, and economic policies towards their countries that uh, things like the School of the Americas, like the banana companies, that have imposed on those countries a government, a politics, a military, an economy that is forcing people to leave. So I would say that we also need to look at U.S. foreign policy. Um, don um, Pastor Casale, la pregunta fue, ¿cuál sería una de las cosas que usted podría, eh, desearía que cambiara en las pólizas de migración? Una cosa que usted le gustaría que cambiara en, la, en las pólizas de migración. Eh, una de ellas, de, creo que la hemos estado mencionando, es... Eh, es, eh, por ejemplo, el tema de emergencia no es, una, no es un asunto de emergencia. Y el tema de que las personas que vienen no son delincuentes, ¿verdad? Y la actitud de, de la política de migración debería ser atender la demanda que está pasando y buscar resolver, eh, ser una, 
resolver el problema más que aumentar el problema. So instead of uh, one thing that he would like to see is um, these conversations of uh, trying to find a solution to all these problems that are happening rather than um, just having um, a negative conversation of racism, uh, ra ra um, or increasing the fear, um, and then uh, so he would like to see more of that conversation on trying to resolve or finding a solution to this problem as people are coming in because um, they're trying to flee from their countries. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Um, well, in the meantime, while we figure out a lasting solution for immigration, one suggestion would be to actually follow the laws that are on the books. Um, for example, asylum law um, has been chopped to pieces in the last year, and, and also even prior to then, different countries based on race or institutionalized racism received different treatment when they're members of those countries came applying for asylum. And that's not what, interna that's, I'm not an expert, but that's not what my understanding of international asylum law is. Um, it's about what a person has experienced uh, in their home country and, and regardless of their racial background or their um, country affiliation. Um, and so I would just recommend that, you know, even while we have the very difficult and complicated and and heart-wrenching conversations about what could lasting um, solutions be that we actually follow the immigration laws that, that are in place now. Just a simple example of uh, asylum. Um, as, as Virginia says, it has been chopped in so many ways. The last case that I personally had experience with, um, the, the person was asking for asylum because her brother was killed in front of her. And the judge said, well, he, the whoever, the gang or whoever in the country did that, it did it to your brother, not to you. And he wasn't able to understand that the, she was asking for asylum because she was fear of her life and that's why she flew. Uh, so things like that is something that immigration faces every day and that unfortunately is not out there that people to see or in the news, but there are, um, immigration is a human, a human right because people are fleeing from their countries or from their fears. So thank you so much for that. Um, last but not least, um, if somebody can just um, make the opinion of this, it says, um, I'm going to read it in Spanish and then I'm going to read it in English. ¿Qué opinión tiene sobre el movimiento actual que está promoviendo la disolución de ICE? ¿Lo apoyarían y por qué? There is a movement right now trying to dissolve or end ICE the Department of um, Immigration and Customs. Um, would you support this movement and why? Anybody will support that? Or any comments? Um, I think that the demand that ICE be abolished is a very important one for symbolic reasons because it is asking us to, to recognize what ICE is doing and how illegitimate the what ICE is doing is. Um, however, I don't think that abolishing ICE is really going to change anything because what ICE is doing now is just going to be assumed by other agencies unless we can make some and some more profound changes. So I don't think it's a realistic goal abolishing ICE, but I do think it's a really important thing to talk about to broaden the conversation. Thank you so much, Avi. And with that thought in mind, I wanted to um, close this program with this in, in, and put this back on you. Definitely, this country, um, from one of the um, testimonies uh, of uh, Mr. Oliveiro said, this, the person that, that had that um, uh, situation in, in the border, he said that this country gives them hope. And I think that we have a very moral obligation United States to lead the way to this immigration policies because migra migration is not happening only in United States, it's happening all over the world. We have Africa, we have Asia, and they, people are just moving around, just trying to flee their conflicts. And in directly, directly or indirectly, United States is influencing that. So the solution is not, not so much to bring all of them to United States, but then find the policies that will cover and help 
to lead the way and lead the example for a better country and more um, the policies that obviously, as you say, Abby, um, not to run the policies from the past, but obviously moving forward, right? So I want to thank everybody again from our panelists that definitely that diverse, a lot of myths have been broken down. There is a lot of conversations, obviously we're not, we have to choose which myths are being saying out there, but there are a lot more. Uh, but again, thank you so much for each one of the expertise that you guys have and the fight that definitely you have in your daily life. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you also for the staff and the media that came. And feel free to just get grab a bite. And thanks again. <laughs> thanks so much again.